Yeah, Laura, you're on. Hello, everyone. And welcome to uh, another in our series of Linked Open Data uh, show and panels presented by the Link. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our, another in our series of Linked Open Data show and tells uh, presented by uh, Igloo Luna Linked Open Data Working Group. And uh, we are fortunate today to have uh, presenters Christine S. Lau, Metadata Technologies Program Manager, and Mark McGee, Geospatial Metadata Librarian from Harvard. Uh, these are, they have been participating in the LD4L Labs and LD4B projects using DibFrame, and um, they have some useful insights uh, to share with us. Uh, we hope that um, uh, you enjoy that their presentations and uh, can get some information from them. And I'm going to turn it over to them now. Okay, thanks, Bye. Laura. Um, good morning and good afternoon to everyone attending today. And thank you to Laura and to the Linked Open Data Working Group for hosting this show and tell today and for inviting myself and my colleague, Christine Aslow, to share with you some of the work uh, we've been doing uh, with Linked Open Data um, at Harvard Library. Uh, we hope that by sharing some of the work today, uh, I'm going to share my screen now. Uh, can you see my screen now? Uh, yep. Okay, hold on a second. Sorry about that. You have to go, yeah. All right. Oh, oh, oh. hello to the infinity loop. Uh, all right, you should be able to see my slides now. Great. Yeah. Great. Okay, thanks. Um, we hope that by uh, sharing some of this work that uh, we've been doing, we can help to further drive conversations in the Ex Libris community about uh, how linked open data can be supported in a library metadata production and uh, discovery environment. So thank you all for joining today. Um, an overview of the talk, um, Christine and I are gonna be uh, passing the laptop back and forth to share with you uh, various aspects of Harvard's uh, linked data for library labs uh, and linked data for production domain projects. Uh, specifically, uh, I'm going to be talking about some of the work that we've been doing with the geospatial and cartographic resources um, domain project. And then Christine will be talking about the moving image uh, project uh, that she's been coordinating. Um, we'll uh, show you, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, discovery and uh, through the LD for L labs, uh, we have built a visual visualization tool, which Christine is going to do live without a net, uh, hopefully. Um, and then um, we're also going to discuss some, uh, we have a Alma linked uh, data working group uh, here at Harvard. We just launched uh, in Alma last or last week. Um, and kind of a lead up to that, uh, we were looking at use cases as part of this working group, and we wanted to share uh, some of the use cases uh, that we developed uh, in that group. Uh, we're going to share some lessons learned around ontology development and reconciliation. Um, we have some ideas about how a UI uh, can help with editing linked data, and then uh, we're going to open up to questions uh, and hopefully um, generate some discussion points uh, with the group. Um, so, uh, but before we can get into that, I did want to provide at least a little bit of background about the Linked Data for, produ for Production and Linked Data for Libraries uh, grants. Um, this provides the broader context for the cartographic materials and the moving image projects. Uh, the Linked Data for Production cartographic materials and moving image projects are both part of uh, a larger Andrew W. Mellon Foundation funded project. Uh, the Linked Data for Production, or LD for P. Uh, the project officially launched March 2016 as a two-year project, and uh, with a three-month extension, it officially ended June 30th, 2018. So, of course, we completed everything on time, and uh, uh, we're still working out a few things. But uh, for the most part, uh, we're going to present uh, what we've accomplished 
today. Um, the LD4P has had uh, six partner institutions that you can see on the screen here. Um, and, and at a high level, um, yeah, these guys here. Um, and at a high level, um, we're attempting to, you know, we were attempting to develop standards, guidelines, infrastructure to communally produce uh, metadata as linked open data. Uh, to develop end-to-end -end workflows to create linked data in a technical services environment. Um, the domain projects are looking at extending the BibFrame ontology to describe library resources in specialized domains. And then uh, a big part of that was also engaging the broader library uh, community to ensure that um, uh, some of the work is sustainable and extensible and has a life uh, beyond the, this project. Um, uh, the specialized domain projects, you probably, you may have heard uh, some of them. Columbia was exploring art objects, um, Cornell uh, exploring rare materials and um, some sound recordings. The Library of Congress was involved in, uh, through their, um, through their uh, cataloging, they were exploring all types of materials. Uh, Princeton was looking at uh, annotations of their uh, Jacques Derrida uh, collection. Um, Stanford looking at performed music and here at Harvard, uh, we were looking at cartographic materials and although not technically part of the LD for P grant, also film and moving images. So, and then as you may have seen uh, on the bib frame discussion list last Thursday, Phil Skur at Stanford announced the next phase of the grant, which started July 1st and it invites other institutions to participate as part of the link data for production cohort um, in this next phase of the grant, the LD4P uh, will be partnering with the Program for Cooperative Cataloging, PCC, to help develop policies and trainings to guide a cohort uh, of participants in experimenting uh, with bib frame based linked data creation in a cloud-based uh, editing environment. So uh, the grant will be developing a sandbox with which uh, PCC participants and uh, uh, people in the cohort can um, kind of uh, play with creating linked data. And the aim, the aim is to build a sustainable community of institutions that can begin to transition from mark-based uh, cataloging to linked data-based uh, cataloging workflows. So that's the LD4P context. Um, LD, linked data for libraries labs is a sibling project that ran uh, in parallel to the linked data for production grant. Uh, and, and in large part, um, it was about um, creating uh, and assembling tools and services uh, and approaches uh, that use linked data in a library context and to build kind of the tools and services that would support the linked data for production um, uh, environment. Uh, but also part of the labs was also looking at uh, improving discovery uh, using an understand, you know, the use and understanding of uh, how scholarly information uh, resources are discovered and uh, found. Um, it, it intended to pilot tools and services and to create solutions uh, that can be implemented in the production uh, environment at research libraries. And uh, I already mentioned that it was really, it, it's really the kind of the tools aspect of um, and the development aspect of uh, the, the two projects. And for the labs project, Harvard focused on uh, specifically on converting a couple of our local special collections into linked open data descriptions. Um, for the geospatial project, uh, we focused on um, converting Harvard Geospatial Library metadata records uh, for digital geospatial resources uh, into linked data descriptions. And then for the film project, we were looking specifically at Harvard Film Archive uh, metadata. Um, we're gonna go into a bit more detail on each of these projects so that you get a sense of the type of work uh, that was involved with converting existing data, as well as how we went uh, about attempting to develop workflows and tools uh, to support natively producing linked data descriptions of resources. And then in addition to the conversion projects at Harvard, the labs grant also supported the building of a local instance of a linked data hosting and editing environment called Vitrolib. Uh, uh, we'll also demo, uh, we have some screenshots of uh, some of the work we've done uh, in Vitrolib. Um, and as well, the labs supported the development of a data visualization and discovery tool, uh, which, as I mentioned, Christine will be demonstrating uh, in a few minutes. So 
Uh, we'll start with uh, linked data uh, for libraries production for cartographic materials. Um, basically, the purpose of, of this was to explore best practices for creating uh, native linked data descriptions for all types of library cartographic resources from printed maps um, to born digital data sets. Um, there's a lot of information available at this wiki address um, if you want to really di dive into some of the work that we were doing. Um, I'm just going to give you a selection of uh, some of the types of works that, that we've been doing. Um, but the intention was really to rethink our approach to how we catalog cartographic resources in a linked data environment. And, you know, by using linked open data models for cataloging, what new types of questions can we ask the catalog that we can't ask now? Um, with possibilities of linked data, what changes about the way we interact with the resources when we actually have the, the, the material in hand. And I would call the project experimental, incomplete, and not necessarily prescriptive. So keep that in mind. Um, this is an example of the type of data that you might come across in our collection. Harvard Map Collection just celebrated its 200th uh, anniversary uh, two weeks ago. We had a, a big uh, reception. Um, so, you know, we have 500,000 cheat maps uh, in our collection, not all, not all of them cataloged yet, um, and as well, we've been scanning uh, some of these maps, as you can see in the background, there is a, um, there's a little, there's a uh, map uh, from, uh, from, was 17, let's see, oops, sorry, from the early 1700s um, of, of Boston before uh, Back Bay was built. And you can see kind of current roads overlaid uh, over uh, this historic map. So we kind of have a we have the full range of types of data that uh, we're thinking about um, describing um, for the project. So to kind of help us um, to guide the work, um, the cartographic res uh, the LD for P cartographic resources um, project, I enlisted a working group. Uh, made up of volunteers from across the cartographic materials cataloging and geospatial metadata library communities. And we met for two years on a bi-weekly basis and together we identified project use cases and uh, we kind of limited them to five researcher, three student, three librarian focused use cases. Um, that would help us guide, you know, help us um, kind of uh, evaluate uh, current models for description, mainly bib frame. Um, and um, kind of guide our what concepts we wanted to go into more detail. Um, here are two examples. Um, what we found was common across uh, use cases uh, for cartographic materials is looking at the types of cartographic uh, materials, uh, feature types on the map, uh, the, uh, very heavy interest in the time component of the maps, um, scale of the maps, uh, relief representation on maps, and of course, uh, location, both uh, explicit coordinate-based uh, um, location and also kind of place name uh, location. So some of these use cases also stretch the expectations of what you might normally um, uh, envision our data and catalog systems being able to answer. Um, so one one of the interesting ones I think was um, was like um, trying to align um, digital file types to software packages that could uh, be used with a particular data set. Um, we didn't prioritize that in our modeling, but I think it gives you a good idea of uh, the possibilities of what we could do with uh, different types of modeling. Um, so to that extent, um, after our discussions of use cases, the working group began to investigate concept areas of ontology modeling and dis you know, discovered limitations to the descriptive models that we had reviewed. Um, mainly BibFrame uh, was our kind of our, our starting point for evaluation. Um, from this, we began to create a new ontology uh, the Geospatial and Cartographic Resources Ontology, or GCRO, um, to help support the descriptive areas uh, that we were interested in exploring in more depth. Uh, the Geospatial and Cartographic Resources Ontology is intended to work in combination with other ontologies to support the description of geospatial and cartographic resources. Uh, BibFrame is the foundational ontology, and G GCRO also relies heavily on Biblioteco 
which is a bib frame extension ontology that was created by the larger LD for P uh, multi-institutional project. And we really didn't want to get into um, ontology building business. Uh, so the goal was to reuse as much of the existing linked open data ontologies uh, where appropriate um, examples of this uh, of ontologies being reused include RDA, uh, GeoSparkle, the web annotations model, DCMI, friend of a friend. Um, uh, in addition to kind of evaluating existing ontologies, we also uh, we wanted to explore uh, being able to use and recommend entity vocabularies, sources that uh, perhaps are not traditionally used in standard library descriptive data. Um, so that uh, to that extent, we looked at things like geonames. You know, are there cataloging efficiencies uh, or gains to be made uh, by using different uh, entity vocabularies? Um, with geonames, uh, rather than like LC geographic names, um, in addition to geonames being more expansive as a database, um, it also includes data points such as feature type, uh, administrative hierarchies, and population data that you might not find um, in the LC data set. So um, uh, based on these kind of modeling areas that we identified as priorities, we developed an OWL-based ontology. Um, and it is available as a beta version from this link. Um, it's only available. Um, some caveats about this is um, it hasn't been rigor rigorously tested yet um, and may undergo significant changes as we learn more about it. Um, and it does not yet have a permanent namespace, so it only uh, currently only really exists as an OWL ontology file. Um, and there's supporting documentation um, available from the wiki that I provided earlier. Um, primary ontologies used with GCRO. Um, it's not intended to be self-contained. Um, it works in conjunction with many other ontologies that go together in describing geospatial and cartographic resources. In many cases, the recommendations of the cartographic materials project will be to defer to the modeling decisions already made within other ontologies. Uh, what you're seeing here is a list of the selected descriptive areas. Um, and the corresponding model ontology that this project uh, had intended to use to test the cataloging of cartographic uh, resources. So, you know, work instances items, we're looking, you know, we're using the BIP frame as basis. Um, activities, titles, uh, subjects, notes and annotations, uh, we're, we're following the Biblioteco uh, recommendations. And then uh, with the skit, these are the, these are the primary areas that we described for uh, geospatial and cartographic extension, scale, relief, projection, coordinates, types of cartographic resources. And we've even re reused some RDA unconstrained, uh, for instance, for prime meridians, which was a new property added uh, fairly recently. And then we're also referring to other um, LD for P ontologies. So for measurements, uh, we, we intend to use the art frame and the rare mat. Um, uh, guidelines for providing measurement. Um, and this this selected ontology, um, and e even this is not as simple as it appears because within these ontologies, um, other ontologies are used within those ontologies. And a, an example of that is um, Biblioteco's recommendation for notes and annotations, which blends web annotations model with some Bib frame properties, as well as some biblioteco defined uh, motivations, um, uh, you know, which you, which you wouldn't find elsewhere. And this combination of selected ontologies that we used here um, is just one of many ways one could approach um, attempting to describe these resources. And Christine is going to go into more detail on s some of the models that I mentioned there as well. So. For the, so an example of where we extended um, BibFrame to better support um, cartographic uh, resources, I'm only going to really show one example. Um, so this is uh, cartographic scale. Um, you can see that uh, we've reused the BibFrame property for scale and the BibFrame class for scale. Uh, but that's really all, all that BibFrame provides as far as context uh, for scale. 
Um, within the bib frame scale object, you could you would have a, um, a label here. You could possibly have an additional BF note. Both of those um, containing literal information and uh, what our group wanted to do was really kind of um, be able to be uh, be more descriptive. Hello, someone trying to contact. Um, be more descriptive about what we could say about a type of scale. So we added, um, you can see three properties that we added here around um, scale accuracy, scale source, um, the representative fraction denominator. So those are G Crow um, additional properties. We reused an RDA uh, element for textual information about a scale. Um, and you can see underneath the BF scale uh, class, we've added subclasses of the type of scale that we're describing. And in this way, we can be far more explicit uh, about representing the, the scale for a given uh, map. And uh, the way that BibFrame is right now, um, there's, no, it's not, it, there's no real good way to say, distinguish a textual piece of information about a scale uh, versus a machine actionable number, which you can see here represented as the XSD integer. So that, that would give us, um, that's typically encoded in 034, um, but the way that some of the, the way that the bib frame model works, it, it, it doesn't have a specific home um, that really identifies it as um, machine actionable. So these are some of the things we are trying to um, represent um, for cartographic. Um, okay, so now that we have an ontology, we have ontology recommendations. What do we really intend to do with it? Uh, Vitrolib is a web-based uh, linked data management tool uh, being developed at Cornell, and uh, you're seeing an interface. You're seeing uh, the Harvard um, geospatial version of Vitrolib. It's a little light, sorry. Um, uh, but Vitrolib, it can be used to create and manage ontologies as well as to create and edit a linked data instance and data itself. And at Harvard, we're running local instances of Vitrolib that are customized to support cartographic and geospatial resources description, as well as a separate instance to support the, the description of the Harvard Film Archive materials. And so what you're seeing here is uh, some data from the Linked Data for Library Lab sibling project of the cartographic materials extension. Uh, that we worked on here at Harvard. So for this project, um, we actually we, we built a converter and converted a set of 8,800 Harvard Geospatial Library uh, and uh, over 5,000 Stanford Earthworks FGDC geospatial metadata records to the target bib frame plus GCRO linked open data ontology. And we ended up with close to, you can see we have around 14,000 um, work and uh, it ended up being about 2 million triples uh, from the conversion. So um, we reconciled agent names in the process, uh, topic keywords, places of publication, place keywords um, to link data entities. Um, and we exper experimented with using some different vocabularies for entities that uh, aren't necessarily always in library data. So for for places, we use geo names, so we reconciled about 16,000 occurrences of place names. Uh, for agents, we reconciled the was uh, loaded into this Vitrolib instance. Um, and this Vitrolib instance, we also intend, uh, we intend it to use to test the cataloging of cartographic resources using the prescribed um, BitFrame Plus ontology. So this is, uh, this is an example of um, some customization work we did for the cartographic resources um, uh, project. Um, so you can see here, there's a cartographic properties tab where we've um, we've leveraged the ontology work done for GCRO and to to um, you know use uh, use the ontology to apply to the description of cartographic resources. Um, Vitro Lib is ontology driven, which means you can add existing ontologies like GCRO into the system, and with some minimal customization work, 
Uh, you can incorporate these ontology properties and classes into the user face and then have catalogers um, just, you know, describe um, resources. Um, and so that's, that's a general interview. That's a general overview of the type of stuff that we're doing for the cartographic and the geospatial project. I'm actually going to hand it over now to to Christine, who will uh, give you an overview of the film project. Hi. So um, we are going to show you a little bit more of Vitrolib with the film project. But first, I wanted to give you a little bit of background. Uh, we were concerned with the Harvard Film Archive data. Um, Harvard, Harvard Film Archive holds around. 30, a little over 36,000 uh, film items right now, and also uh, papers and posters and other supporting materials. Um, and in the Moving Image Domain project uh, where we converted this, we didn't foreground community consensus quite in the way that Mark did um, in his project, but we focused on collection-specific conversion and metadata production first in the hopes of producing a proof of concept for uh, local stakeholders and for a broader community reaction. Um, which is a way of admitting that as a non-expert in archival film, and I'm also not an employee of the Harvard Film Archive, um, I consulted with staff at the Film Archive um, and, uh, and other film archives uh, to, um, whose data we converted, um, but I skirted the community and buy-in processes that Mark painstakingly engaged in for his domain project. Uh, our source data is an internal FileMaker database. Oh, wait. I forgot to say what our purpose was. So uh, similarly to uh, the project that Mark just, just described, um, we were exploring and assessing issues in converting legacy metadata from moving image resources to linked data, um, and also exploring the issues in making that linked data useful for research and discovery. But we also wanted to create uh, some native linked data descriptions. Um, and uh, we were especially concerned with underexposed uh, films, uh, in particular those by women directors. We also did concentrate a little bit on uh, avant-garde films. Um, I realized that the categories of women directors and avant-garde are, uh, are both a little bit problematic, but this is um, we were trying to sift out things that were not necessarily easily discoverable in uh, the systems that we currently have, um, and also just generally not as exposed in the world at large. Um, so, uh, our source data was an internal FileMaker database, um, which is still in use at the Film Archive, um, and it consists of two tables. Uh, we primarily uh, drew upon the filmographic table. You're seeing a screen cap of one tab within the filmographic table here. This uh, deals largely with content. Um, it's probably a little bit small on your screen, but you can see where, you know, it's, you know, describing the condensed feature of Taxi Driver, more, more about that later, as a fiction film, a fiction short, a short, a drama, and also as a, a don't miss it archivist choice um, and a print in ac acceptable condition. Um, so uh, the, we, we primarily use the filmographic table, but there's also a table for um, uh, data that related to loans to other institutions that we drew upon a little bit as well. Uh, it's worth noting that unlike the cartographic and geospatial data, this wasn't data that was created according to widely adopted community standards and rarely, rarely included terms uh, that were recognizable from controlled vocabularies. But there is a lot of evocative data in here about um, content and physical characteristics that are important to internal workflows, um, but also you know, really expressive of the kinds of materials that are being collected here and the differences between them. Um, we could have converted some data from Mark. Uh, there's uh, about 5,000-ish descriptions that are in our library catalog uh, that were created by human catalogers. And uh, there are also finding aids, uh, but we really wanted to foreground the, the breadth and the, uh, of the collection and also try to plumb its hidden depths. Um, we worked with Film Archive staff. Oh, and here's a, a shot of the, um, the loan table. In this case, the condensed feature 20 minute version of Taxi Driver did get loaned out to the Anthology Film Archives for a screening in 2015. OK. Um, and speaking of the depth of the collection, uh, here is one of the women filmmakers uh, whose work is well represented in the Harvard Film Archive, but pretty much nowhere else. This is Anne Charlotte Robertson, a local filmmaker who did autobiographical films. Um, she is. A character. Okay, um, so we worked with Film Archive staff to crosswalk terms that were used consistently within the data to terms that were uh, used more broadly in libraries, such as genres from 
uh, FAST and AAT, and we minted terms where necessary relating them to existing terms in the hopes of uh, preserving some interoperability. Um, the project was also more focused on producing entities to represent agents. Um, oh, back to Anne, Anne Charlotte Robertson, we really wanted to represent agents, um, with an emphasis on women filmmakers, uh, some of whom are locally relevant or rarely collected outside of the Harvard Film Archive. Um, other areas of emphasis included the relationship between works and fi individual physical items and between works and works, as the collection includes multiple copies of varying quality per work, as well as trailers, preprint footage, and various cuts for various types of releases, such as the 20 minute version of Taxi Driver. Uh, so working with the previous Metadata Technologies Program Manager, Stephen Folsom, uh, who's now uh, back at Cornell, we interviewed Harvard Film Archive staff to generate use cases. Um, we kind of uh, should have limited ourselves more, uh, as Mark did. Um, uh, we have six related to screenings and programs, uh, nine related to researcher needs, five to collection development, seven to physical ma materials and preservation. Um, about that first category, I should mention that the Harvard Film Archive, in, in addition to collecting and preserving films, also has a movie theater uh, where uh, it shows films both from its own collection and borrowed from other collections. So uh, programming, um, creating film programming year round is one of the, uh, is one of the concerns of, for their metadata. Uh, ultimately, the data we produced focuses on far fewer of these um, th these use cases, but a few of these here are um, as a creator of film programming at the Carpenter Center, I would like to identify the best projection print of a specific film that has English language subtitles. Uh, or as a researcher, I want to compare the durations of multiple film prints of The Wicker Man to each other and to other known copies of the film. This one has a, a historical precedent in that um, the Harvard Film Archive uh, several years ago um, in a fairly well-known anecdote, uh, turned out to have a print that was longer than anyone else's print of The Wicker Man. And so there were a couple, you know, there was like 30 seconds of The Wicker Man that no one had seen since its initial release. Um, so um, I'm not going to read all of these out loud, but I'll move on since I think we are taking more time than we initially taken when we timed ourselves. Um, OK. Um, so. Uh, so many, many decisions and resulting conversion processes follow a similar path to what Mark has described for geospatial data with, and I would offer analogous uh, caveats about our experiment being incomplete and not necessarily prescriptive. Uh, we used Bibframe and Biblioteco as um, our core, and uh, if there is an overall theme uh, to our divergences, it's around how we handled activities and agents, which um, is related to how Biblioteco models uh, activities. We'll get to more of that later. Um, but also um, the overall theme that share Biblioteco shares is uh, a general emphasis on sifting out machine actionable data, uh, either in terms of object uh, properties or um, specific data type properties, uh, like for example, in this case, durations, which you know, having mathematic, like having integers for durations, is really useful so that you can calculate, you can compare so something like one print of the Wicker Man to another, um, versus having strings as uh, data type properties, as is the case with many bit frame properties. Um, if you use just vanilla bit frame, so uh, an overall theme of machine actionability. Um, being um, something that we want to uh, foreground. Um, so back to, um, oh yeah, the biggest divergence aside from format specific needs is how we handled agents. Uh, agents in the film data were the exception where we did a lot of manual intervention. Um, oh, sorry, uh, here we go. Um, sorry, my slides are slightly out of order and I apologize. Uh, and Okay, we'll have to pick that up again later. Um, so uh, here's an example of where we modeled works um, and work-to-work -work relationships reusing existing terms from BibFrame and RDA unconstrained properties, uh, as well as newly minted sub-properties of those terms that were specific to our extension. Um, it's we where you see dotted lines is where we um, where we hoped to infer relationships between different works. Uh, instead of um, necessarily encoding all of those in our data. Um, this could be accomplished through Sparkle queries or through uh, reasoners uh, built into tools like Protege. Um, the example here, uh, 
uh, assumed that we could infer relationships um, using shared identifiers um, and using properties of, uh, you know, like reflexive properties and, and so forth to, to make inferences. And the example here shows relationships between different versions of Taxi Driver, which include a 20 minute cut with added voiceover narration that was intended for the home projector market in the era before uh, VHS tapes, as well as a trailer for Taxi Driver. And you can also see here some of our decisions around using um, fast for, uh, for genres and, uh, and for form. Um, so agents in the film data were an exception where we did a lot of manual intervention. Um, uh, here we were using Biblioteco, some DC terms, some terms borrowed from ISNI and FOF. Um, ISNI is the International Standard Name Identifier. Uh, it's an ISO standard. Uh, a group of catalogers at Harvard um, heroically searched and minted ISNI public identities to describe over a thousand film directors in our collection. And that was an early trial of what later became the Project for Cooperative Cataloging's uh, ISNI pilot. Uh, so some stats about conversion. Uh, we. You, we converted about 35,000 film items uh, uh, from the FileMaker database. Uh, used those two tables to um, that we that we queried using SQL to extract XML from FileMaker. Converted into Turtle using a tool that was developed at Cornell, but customized heavily for this purpose. Uh, this resulted in around 3,600,000 triples, which uh, was the scale of it became uh, an issue for being able to uh, load it into other tools and to edit it. Um, and as I mentioned before, uh, we did a lot of reconciliation, but in particular for uh, names, we uh, did a lot of one by one uh, work using spreadsheets and then creating files to feed it into the conversion process. Um, with, uh, and we created a lot of entities uh, in that process. So now I'm coming back to Vitrolib, and uh, I'm not doing a live demo here, but I wanted to step you through a couple of things that um, we customized in Vitrolib so that we could enhance the data. Here is an example from Anne Charlotte Robertson's uh, collection. Uh, here um, she did a very long multi-part film called Five Year Diary. It's literally a diary in film format from five years of her life. Uh, it covers lots of cooking and hanging out and uh, for some reason, standing around the leotard a lot. Um, and uh, she also donated this to the film archive. Um, we, while we concentrated on entities for filmmakers, uh, often they served multiple roles. Uh, and in this, in this case, they also serve the role of donor for a particular item. Um, so uh, as Mark mentioned earlier, you can, uh, for any given property, you can click on the little plus sign in Vitrolib. And uh, in this case, it brings us to a customized form that we, we had a developer create uh, where you can select a particular activity type um, and choose which resource to look up an agent from. In this case, since we're working with ISNI, uh, we would select ISNI. And so this is um, probably a little hard to read, but you can see that I've typed in Robertson comma Ann, and uh, we're still kind of getting the hang of the ISNI APIs and how to get like uh, more, but we had our pulling in just the, the most common label for a given entity, it's really hard to tell apart um, uh, Ann Robertson uh, from, you know, uh, New South Wales and versus Ann Robertson who wrote Effects of a Cognitive Acceleration Program on Year One Pupils, et cetera. And as you can see, our Ann Robertson isn't actually in this, like near anywhere near the top of this list. Um, still figuring out the mysteries of the uh, API, but if you put in her uh, middle name, uh, she comes right up. Um, and here, the only uh, data that we entered about her um, is this three letter, this sort of opaque three letter code after her name, FMK, which indicates that uh, one of the roles that she plays um, is as, as a filmmaker. Um, and here's her record in ISNI that we created in the course of this project. Uh, another example in Vitrolib is here's our uh, condensed feature of Taxi Driver. Um, we 
one uh, piece of data that we did not have a lot of luck converting because uh, the data was not granular enough and we didn't go down some kind of um, uh, named entity rabbit hole uh, or we didn't have time to um, was uh, cast members. So uh, here we've got you know, cinematographers and composers and so forth listed for Taxi Driver, but not Robert De Niro. Uh, so adding a, an activity, we can choose the actor role. Um, you, what you're seeing here is like a alphabetical um, fraction of the beginning of the uh, activity uh, classes that are available in Biblioteca. And uh, Robert De Niro, fortunately, is much easier to retrieve from ISNI than Anne Charlotte Robertson. Um, so here's uh, just a close up of the um, Biblioteco uh, uh, model um, where we've zoomed in on activity, uh, just so that you can see that there's, uh, there are a number of things that can be associated with an activity and it doesn't necessarily have to be about agents. Um, an activity can have a location, um, it can have a date in EDTF format, and uh, this means that you could have a release activity, as we do in many films, that doesn't necessarily have an agent on it because we like some things are obscure and we don't know like you know who is responsible for its release, but we do know what country and what year. Uh, here's another example from uh, Taxi Driver. Uh, here we've got some some terms that we selected from RDA uh, unconstrained properties. Uh, and also some uh, moving image extension specific terms. So is short version of, has shorter version of, has trailer, and is trailer for. And as you can see, these don't really look like linked data properties. They don't have namespaces on them. There are spaces between the words. They look human readable. This is intentional. Uh, Vitrolib has a feature called faux properties that allow you to essentially put a skin over um, something that might be opaque, like an RDA uh, unconstrained property, which just has a numerical uh, value or um, something else where you know you're trying to give it a unique identifier, but you can't always make it necessarily readable or understandable. So um, I'm just going to switch to a slide where we've turned on um, a more robust display that is intended for um, not necessarily for catalogers. So you might have to squint a little bit because there's a lot of tiny blue text here, but you can see that ha has shorter version and is shorter version of our RDA properties. And um, in the case of has trailer and is trailer four, um, these are just human readable labels for um, the moving image extension. So MI colon is promoted by, and MI colon is promo promotion for, which are kind of awkward phrasings, but make sense in a linked data context. Um, Unfortunately, so here's a dead end. Unfortunately, when we choose is shorter version of, and we'd like to choose the longer version of Taxi Driver, we're unable to uh, to select a known um, a known work from our data uh, because Vitrolib is a little bit tricky to configure, and uh, the selection of existing entities and the selection of named entities from our ontologies was an ongoing issue that we never managed to handle consistently. Um, and now that I've shown you a bunch of slides of a tool, I'm going to uh, delve into the Perilous live demo of another tool. Um, so what I'll be showing next is our attempt at a Sparkle-based foundation for showing what we hope are some expressive possibilities in the Harvard data converted in the course of these projects. Uh, apologies to anyone who already saw some version of this at Stanford's LD4 workshop this past spring. This will be a bite-sized version of the talk that I gave with Dan McCary, our visualization developer. Um, and we hope that it sparks a little discussion about what the value of seeing descriptions of resources within a spatialized representation of a collection uh, can do, and hopefully also the impact of decisions about metadata production. Uh, we wanted to demonstrate that using data from external URIs can make our data richer, uh, and that it's not all about just pulling in data from other sources, but, um, but about linking. Uh, we wanted to provide a user experience that isn't about known items, but aspires to serendipitous encounters and new observations. And we wanted to give individual items context within our collection and uh, within the wider world. When we set about asking what we wanted our converted RDF uh, to do for us and for users, we looked at existing UIs for our source data and existing visualizations of linked open data. I'm kind of shooting fish in a barrel here by throwing in the giant linked data graph because this is everyone's seen this before and everyone um, 
probably knows how tangled, how how much more tangled it gets every every passing moment. Um, but in general, they tended to be these spider webby things that we found. Um, the legacy film data um, right now has been largely accessible through keyword searches for known items and the map data through map-based spatial searches. And we wanted to move on to something that we couldn't already do with our source data, um, but existing linked data visualizations seem to express complexity um, most of all. Uh, when we were when what we were interested in was uh, individual resources um, that seemed to get lost in there in these uh, tendrils, a lot of our data pointed to opaque URIs, as I mentioned, um, uh, lacking labels, and no longer having access to. Um, at this point in the project, we no longer had access to a developer who could modify the converted data to generate more user friendly labels. Um, so we didn't see the labels, and um, and in. It, in, a, in traditional network graphs, a compelling foundation for user engagement or um, meaningful uh, manipulation of our linked data seemed really hard without um, something human readable. Uh, we wanted to utilize the connections between entities in our data, um, but what does it mean to have them you know, vi visualized as literal webs? So our goal was to help users understand uh, resources that make up our, our unique collections. Um, so how might we go about that while enriching um, our understanding with data that we didn't have to create or manage locally. So the Perilous Live demo. Um, so we were asking, I don't know that we have uh, definitive answers to these questions. This is, again, not prescriptive um, and uh, experimental. But you know, we wanted to say, you know, can we make something that looks cool without reambiguating what we've already taken pains to disambiguate? Um, and in a lot of ways, the uh, process of creating a visualization tool was the inverse of our ontology process and mapping and conversion work in that we had proceeded slowly with that. And with this, we started with prototypes uh, that our developer created and reacted to them and reconsidered the possibilities and iterated. Uh, so continuing that advent adventure spirit, we're, uh, we're embarking on the perils of a live demo, focusing on a subset of our bib frame data where country names were normalized and then recon reconciled to uh, geographic entities. Mark, I should be able to just, um, yeah, let's see. We're going to try to switch windows and see what happens. OK. Um, hopefully, everyone can see, sees a blank, a black browser window here. Yes? OK. Um, I will take your, uh, your silence as uh, an affirmative. Um, so this is um, so this this tool uh, will be launched as a web service that other people can log into and create and save queries. And right now, this includes queries uh, that were created for the purposes of demonstration. Um, so the first one I'm going to select is a query that's been saved called HFA moving image with release location. Um, so uh, this is running. Um, our data is in uh, a product called uh, Neptune, which is part of Amazon Web Services. Um, it's, I think it recently came out of beta. Ours, was, ours is a beta instance, um, which was nice because it was free. Um, so hopefully I can actually find the button that's hiding behind the sharing window. There we are. Um, so it's querying our triple store right now. And it's actually relatively fast, given the number of uh, triples that I mentioned are in there. So over 3 million. Um, here we go. Um, so instead of going with a web, we went with uh, lots of little squares. Um, and this is uh, manipulable in like three-dimensional space. We're using um, soft, uh, a language called WebGL. And it's also using taking advantage of uh, d3.js and 3.js. Um, I did not code this, so I cannot tell you more about those things. But our developer can probably answer your questions. Um, so as you can see, you can zoom into things. You can manipulate this um, this chunk of items in space. And if we zoom in, hopefully we can do this with your trackpad, except Mark's trackpad is totally different than my trackpad. So um, I am at a loss here, because I didn't practice this on his computer. But here we go. I think we're zooming in now. OK, so as you can see, we've got individual blocks. And uh, you can see a text overlay in the top right corner. Um, this is less than ideal. Uh, WebGL is great for handling lots and lots of particles um, hanging out in space. But rendering um, lots of text at that scale uh, it slows things down uh, immeasurably. So we've got this little, um, 
this little overlay in the corner. And every time you mouse over something, you can see this is a trailer of Immortal Beloved, or this is um, uh, Hollywood on Parade. I don't know this film, um, and so forth. Uh, right now, we're just showing uh, titles. We can um, look more at the data that we brought in through this query, and it includes locations. Uh, I'm going to zoom out a little bit so that you can sort of see the overview again. And I really should have tested it on this computer. Oh my god. Um, so, um, so when we look at locations, we see geonames, IDs here. Um, they're a little bit cut off um, in, on this screen. I apologize. Um, but the first one is a, the geonames ID for United States. And you can see that the collection is heavily from the United States because the pixels light up um, when we mouse over this. Um, and other countries less so. But we've got these opaque IDs and no labels for them. So we're going to fix that by doing another query and then joining it with this one. Um, so we're actually uh, hitting a, uh, an API that returns JSON from uh, GeoNames. And we're querying it for all country names. Um, I'm going to hide the previous layer so that you can see this. So here, here is every country that's in GeoNames. And I'm going to color code this differently so that you can see it better. I'm going to go with toxic green. Um, and here we've got a lot of data from GeoNames, um, including um, hierarchical data like what continent is each country in. And you can see the pixels light up for like, you know, here are countries in Africa. And if you mouse over them, obviously, you can see um, uh, the country name here is Bahamas. Um, here's its currency code, its GeoNames ID, its languages, its capital, and so forth. Um, and so something like its name, uh, maybe its coordinates, uh, what you know, what administrative hierarchy or continent is it a part of, could be really useful um, in our data set where we're not encoding any of that. So what we're going to do, and again, with risky live demo, I apologize if this doesn't work. We're going to select. GeoNames ID, and we're going to select our previous query, and we're going to target the location property from that. Um, location isn't really the property. It's like the, the variable name from the Sparkle query. We're going to hit Join, and then we're going to go back here. Um, and in our original query, as you can see, this hasn't changed. Oh, we have to show this again. Um, so you can overlay any number of layers. I'm just going to shut off the overlays right now to make it less confusing. Um, so here you've got GeoNames IDs, and um, that's the same as it was when we first loaded it. But now you've got a ton of geographic data that's been loaded from it. So now you can see um, here are all the films um, from North America, not just the films from the United States. Here are all the films from Europe, not just specifically France. So we're taking advantage of the hierarchical data. But also now we can, um, we can also see um, if I could move this over, um, if this over, if the overlay in the top left corner was more visible, you could also see things like country name um, displayed for uh, alongside things like the title. Um, so uh, I'm not going to spend a lot more time in this, but I do want to show one more uh, thing, um, which is I'm going to create a query for an external endpoint specifically Wikidata, to search for all early 20th century films. We didn't use any, we used very few Wikidata entities in this, in, in our conversion project. Um, but one of the themes of the next LD, uh, LD4P uh, grant is going to be working with Wikidata to create entities to supplement the descriptions we're creating and linking to those. So hopefully, we'll be able to take more advantage of this kind of data. So it's hitting an external endpoint. It's a big query. It's taking a little bit longer. Um, and I realize that we're running out of time, so I'm going to hurry up. Um, uh, I'm going to just change this to a different color so that you can sort of see how it compares size-wise to the collection. Obviously, these are works versus items. OK. Back to presentation. Thank you for your patience. Um, how do I? Oh, present. OK. Thank you. Hopefully, you can see our slides again. Um, just want to say that um, the second URL on this um, on this screen is where the um, the tool, which will be freely available for probably the next year or so, at least, um, will be available sometime in the near future. Um, watch that space.
Um, and here were slides that I inserted in case things didn't work. Okay, so um, we're gonna just briefly go through some lessons learned from ontology development in the hopes that we'll have time for questions. Um, it's probably trite by now to say this, but reusing existing classes and properties before minting new ones isn't just good linked data practice, it will save you lots of work. We also recommend working iteratively through the process of ontology development and especially conversion mapping, even if it feels slow. Uh, prioritizing use cases and modeling in manageable chunks is preferable to modeling and trying to convert all the data that's available to you. As your model gets more complex and your output scales up, having a UI ready to import your data so that it's readable by humans or more humans than just you, um, or so that you can, uh, or, or taking the time to thoughtfully develop Sparkle queries will help you to validate your data. Another point that may seem obvious but is worth restating uh, is that community support and ownership are needed from the outset, as is a pathway for implementation and maintenance. Reconciliation wasn't built into any of the tools in use or in development in the grant, so we were forced to create tables that mapped specific string values in our data to external entities where it was, where it was possible to do so. And some of this was achieved by using existing scripts, but most, much of it was only possible through uh, manual labor. We were able to link to external entities so that our linked data had actual links in it, but we found that our approach, which was born of necessity, had limits, and accuracy and scalability were not always at strongest points. We had planned to remediate the data as a metadata production task, but usable cataloger-friendly inter interfaces weren't available in the time frame needed to make significant headway. I'm gonna hand this over to Mark now because clearly I'm too long-winded to stay within time limits, and he's going to talk a little bit more about um, more general linked data working group use cases and wrap up. Yeah, so I'm gonna be very brief about this. Uh, so the use cases uh, that we developed for the Alma Linked Data Working Group kind of helped us to engage with Ex Libris as we were kind of learning more about Alma. And we ha we have we have several that I believe we shared with the, the uh, Linked Data Working Group here um, in a document, and there's a link uh, to those at the end, so I, I won't go into these in detail, but here's a simple use case where you have a URI of an existing uh, entity, an author in this case, and you just want to query um, the existing uh, uh, data set uh, retrieve information related to that. More pie in the sky, we have a geospatial data set that has some locations and times, and we want to retrieve, again, resources that uh, relate to those places and times uh, through, through a Sparkle query, but also then to display it in some kind of visual way uh, in, a, in a discovery interface um, would be kind of a, a long-term goal to see in a discovery in, uh, environment. So I'll leave it at that. Um, and then we had some ideas about how a UI uh, would be helpful for editing in a linked data environment. Uh, we found that cataloger intervention is always, it, comes back to cataloger intervention in many cases, especially around validation of automated reconciliation processes, asserting relationships that can't be uh, derived from legacy data and by actually having the data in hand. And what we'd like to see from these UIs is the flexibility to look, you know, look up uh, external data sources, um, the ability to reuse and integrate um, non bib frame properties and uh, to facilitate the creation of these entities as needed for these other environments. So um, there's related links and resources, and we have two minutes for questions, and I apologize. But we, we can follow up with questions after as well. We're happy to do that.
Um, to answer, um, so is there time to give a quick answer or, okay. Um, so to answer, like, oh, what? Okay, so to give a couple of really quick answers, um, we're actually trying to rethink the entire um, metadata workflow for um, publicly shared metadata around the Harvard Film Archive right now. So um, and right now we do uh, a FileMaker to Mark conversion that has not been especially sustainable um, or especially rich. So um, uh, there is um, how we've been looking at creating data um, in a linked data way um, and especially like authority creation and so forth is something that we're thinking about in terms of creating um, records, um, mark records or other um, data that can be shared publicly. Um, and uh, I forgot your other question. Oops. Oh, about sharing the data publicly. Yeah, yeah um, I think uh, we, Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, I think I think right now our systems can make the most use of Mark, but um, sharing the data publicly um, in a persistent way that like enables people to use it requires a commitment to infrastructure and um, and to both um, you know creating interfaces that are machine usable um, like Sparkle endpoints and or linked data fragment servers or so forth, but also um, dereference to human readable things and um, uh, Mark, do you want to share any thoughts about this? Or I just realized I hijacked this whole question. Yeah, we've we've talked about an infrastructure workflow at Harvard. Um, we we don't have that technical support for it yet, uh, but we looked at something like uh, library cloud for linked data um, as a means of sharing. I, and I think this is a large uh, part of what the LD4P ongoing grant is going to be looking at as you know, how. How do we exchange this data and how do we share it? Um, so that's going to be one of the outcomes of, of that grant. Well, we're happy to answer questions via email. We can share our slides too, Laura. Sure. We can also share, we, Mark was just saying, we can also share our slides if that's helpful. Thanks for having us. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs>